would you say that is quite advisable for a young South African to study abroad, maybe looking at those things? Um, you went to the UK um, in 1972. Eight. 70, when was it? 78. Yes. To Oxford. Yes. I mean, I mean, it's hard. I mean, it's hard to. I mean, it's uh, or maybe I don't know, but it seems very hard to get into Oxford. Eh? How did you? Um, but you are very brilliant, of course. We know. Uh, <laughs> but I'm just saying. <laughs> It's very hard to get into Oxford, you know. <laughs> so, how was your experience uh, in the UK? Particularly, even at the time, it was a time of apartheid in South Africa, and I think you are the first Black Rhodes Scholar. And um, you know, and, and 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 how how was how was your experience in the UK at the time? It was an eye opener in uh, in, in in many respects. Um, I think one, having spent the first six years of my university education at Forte, <clears throat> um, I think from third year, there were three of us in third year mathematics. Um, from there onwards, I, well, let me say for honors and masters. I was the only student uh, in class. And then you compare that to, you go to Oxford, you are a graduate student, there are literally 100, 200 graduate students. So the difference here is that you are now in a community where you can talk to people about what you are doing, as opposed to you are the only one. And the only person you can talk to is your lecturer, if they are available. Okay. Um, the second one is, I mean, related to that is that uh, Forte was an ethnic university in the sense that, like, like other universities at that time, Vits, okay, yeah, let's say University of Zululand, what was called University of the North, which is University of Limpompo, by ethnic universities that, these were universities which were only allowed to admit black people from a certain ethnic group. So Forte was for Kosa speaking people. And if you were Peji speaking, they would say apply to the University of the North. If you were Zulu speaking, they would say apply to the University of Zulu. Okay. So then you could say it was homogeneous linguistically. And maybe by and large, we came from the Eastern Cape because that's where most of the tossers are. And then you end up at a university where literally there are people from every region in the world, from South America, from North America, from the Indian continent, from Australia, from Germany, and so on and so forth. So again, as I was saying is that uh, you get exposed to other people's life experiences. Which, which enriches your life. Um, and then, of course, being away from home, uh, um, we, 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 you grow up in a community, your family, your extended family. I come from a village in the Eastern Cape. And you are removed from them. And at that time, there were no cell phones. Uh, there was no email. Uh, of course, there were telephone, the line telephones. So the way you communicate with your, I'm the youngest at home, was very close to my mother. Uh, the way I communicated, stayed in touch with her was writing letters, okay? And put it in an envelope and mail it and wait maybe for three, four weeks before you get a response. Uh, or save some money and, and call. But in the village, there were no, Telephone, there's no, there was no access to telephones. So that sense of being disconnected 
from from your community is the other one. And then, of course, I think, I mean, I grew up under apartheid. These were apartheid years. Um, Britain is a, uh, is a white, I mean, English speaking, or the UK uh, people, yeah. And, and uh, this was, I mean, I, the first time I saw a white laborer digging on the road, I was kind of stunned because in South Africa, you wouldn't find that. <laughs> Hard labor was done by black people. <laughs> so I said that, what happened to this guy that they have to dig trenches or clean? <laughs> you see, you see what I'm trying to say. So that was striking as well. And, and of course, yeah, another comparison, um, it's uh, growing up under apartheid, access to read, to literature, to access to, to quite a number of things was restricted. Movies, certain movies were banned. Um, I mean, we never saw a picture of uh, Utiatu Mandela. Never, never. You couldn't. You couldn't have a picture of him. You couldn't have, you couldn't have anything written about him or that quoting him. So you go to the UK, which is maybe in terms of access to reading material, is La South Africa now. You go to the uh, to the bookshop, you go to the library. It's like being a child in a in a sweet store. What do I grab that? Do I grab that? So also it, it uh, and of course I mean watching TV. I said I said earlier on there was no TV well, I mean, I left in 78 and TV started in 76. So the lifestyle was completely different. And yeah, it, 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 was, it was an eye opener. And I think it, it shaped my outlook from then onwards. There are some views and positions that I've taken, um, which were informed by my experiences at that time. I don't know if you still remember the maths ball. In the School of Mathematics, there used to be something called the maths ball where they would then invite the academics and the third year, I think the third year students. Uh, remember, I think the time when we were still on the other side, um, it used to be like a you know, like a, a very fun day and then we'd come in and we'd have some drinks and then we'd interact with the lecturers as students and stuff. And and I remember during that, I was uh, still in undergrad at the time and I spoke to you. Probably you, wouldn't, you, you, you would not remember. It was a long time ago. I still have the picture on my phone. Um, I would like to day. see that. And I, I can't remember. What, yeah, we, we, we spoke and I... I don't remember the question that I asked you, but we spoke about something around this, and you advised me that if you can, you must study abroad. Because my question was, I see a lot of, um, at the time I think you just retired, if I'm not mistaken, from your post as vice-chancellor. And what I see is that a lot of VCs and a lot of the top executives of institutions um, of higher learning if not most of them, they had a stint abroad. You'd find that maybe someone went to Manchester, even if it was for a year and stuff like that. And then the question that I used to ask myself was that, does that actually catapult you? Does it actually project you to these higher positions and stuff? So would you say that is quite advisable for a young South African to study abroad, maybe looking at those things? That is a very difficult question for me to answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I did say earlier on that exposure um, to different environments uh, does help or get it, becoming known. You can't become known uh, kind of staying at the same institution all your life. You have you have to go out there. 
Um, so, and mm-hmm. I mean, there are, there are many advantages in terms of uh, broadening your perspectives, uh, going elsewhere. Um, but on the other hand, I think when one looks at our university system, we need to retain our talent. Uh, because what happens is that in a number of cases, people go abroad, they do well, uh, they find opportunities there, and they never come back, which is a loss to the country. So there, there, there is that that one has to take into consideration. Um, so it, it's, it's a it's a difficult it's something it's something one has to balance depending on um, there is a benefit to the individual, I would say, in terms of exposure and making contacts um, and learning more about other environments. But in the event that those bright young minds are snapped up by others and they don't come back, it's a loss to our country. So one has to balance those two.